planning your next trip into the Nine Hells, consider the following a handy travel advisory for those heroes either brave or foolish enough to venture to the very heart of true evil. Five things you may not know about the Nine Hells, right now on Riches and Liches. Welcome adventurers, I'm Rich and this is Riches and Liches, where it's all things Dungeons and Dragons, tabletop role-playing, and at least today, fiendish devils. As many of you that follow my communication efforts on the channel may already know, I'm currently deep into production on a massive multi-part lore series covering the Nine Hells in excruciating detail, and I aim to create the definitive lore series on this most fascinating and terrifying plane of existence. In it, we will dedicate entire episodes, we're talking about at least 13 parts, covering each of the nine layers, the origin and history, the geography, the rulers, the politics, trials, reckonings, and a few surprises. Now, the process of creating these epic-sized projects is a significant time sink. I really want to get all these ideas in my brain onto video, and my ultimate goal is to create a definitive lore series covering all of the planes included in the Great Wheel of Cosmology. Of course, I'd like to do this as quickly as possible, but the research, the accuracy, and the production quality of the videos is very important to me. Sadly, I see some other outlets just reading verbatim from the source material, and I'm just not going to do that, even if it does speed things up. So, these projects will simply take some time, and there aren't really any shortcuts, so I'm going to have to ask for your patience. However, to help the time pass a bit more quickly, to sate your appetite just a bit, and to thank you for that patience, I thought it might be fun to create some primer videos as an appetizer to this fiendish main course. And this new video series that I'm launching today will do just that. Five things you may not know. This will cover a plethora of various and differing subjects in the future, but today the subject is, of course, the Nine Hells. I have always thought myself pretty well versed in the Dungeons and Dragons lore, specifically as it pertains to both the history and events of the Devils and Demons, but I've learned a few things in my research that I simply didn't know, so maybe you will too. I do need to put a disclaimer out here in advance of the comments these videos will most certainly generate. Like many of the epic events and set pieces in Dungeons & Dragons lore, time and game versions have created obfuscation, conflicts, and outright retcons that often muddy the timelines and the historical accuracy, 4th edition being the most obvious. But that's really unavoidable, and at the end of the day, it's your table, your game, and your universe, so my recommendation is to never let any lack of clarity stop you from enjoying what is still some fascinating lore. So pick a version of the canon you find most enjoyable and accurate and make that the factual history of your world. For the upcoming definitive lore series, I really try to stick to the sources that I find as canon, specifically the second and third editions of the game, making note of fringe theories, conflicts, and retcons wherever possible. However, for today's Five Things video, as you'll soon see, we definitely tread into the murkiness of speculation, theory, and rumor, which can also be a ton of fun. So grab your archaeology hat, here are five things you may not know about the Nine Hells. We start today's Five Things with an interesting archaeological find, an alternative origin story regarding Beator as a civilization that existed in a time before the Devils arrived to claim their domain. This mythology is one of several diverging branches from the Asmodian and Beator origin tree that we will encounter in our lore travels. While the absolute truth can likely never be known, there does exist a scattering of evidence across a few official sources that make mention of this civilization as the ancient Beatorians, existing before the creation of the Nine Hells. Unfortunately for us lore explorers, there does not exist any official source material from TSR or Wizards that describes anything more than the passing references to these ancient Beatorians, but their very mentioning in and of itself does imply that they did indeed exist. Piecing together the historical fragments we do have is not easy, but in doing so we can, at least, make the case for this civilization, now lost to time, as well as the fiendish transformation of their realm. Whether this alternative origin becomes canon in your world is left up to you, fair Dungeon Master. I only present the information for you to consider. 
We start with the earliest reference, found in the 1982 advanced Dungeons & Dragons adventure, The Lost City, module B4, which introduced the Dungeons & Dragons universe to an entirely new world, a fascinating realm and underground city located in a desert plain named Senadicia. This first source includes references to the culture and politics of these desert people, as well as introducing us to the malevolent power known only as Zargon. In this adventure, we explore the origins of this evil entity, being discovered by these Sendadesians in his ancient desert pyramidic lair. While the Lost City module was, for its time, a well-documented adventure with some detailed backstory from which we can dig, we're left to draw some of our own conclusions where gaps exist. The next stop in our archaeology of these ancient people takes us forward 22 years to 2004 and Dragon Magazine number 315, which provides more historic clues on the Senadesians. We learn that the desolate wasteland region they inhabited was called the Great Alazian Desert, and that through a combination of magic and engineering, they were able to create a fertile paradise of sorts. This reference also gives us our first historic conflict on these people, Whereas the 1982 module documents that Zargon was awakened from his desert pyramid lair, here we're told that Zargon was imprisoned in a sealed cavern underground and that the Sendadesians unwittingly freed this fiendish power who then devoured his liberators and enslaved the people. Depending on how you read the available literature, both versions of Discovery could be true as two separate events by two different generations of these same people, all of this occurring over a timeline that is unfortunately not well established. Regardless, to survive, these ancient Beatorians were forced to provide regular blood sacrifices too and eventually came to worship the eternally voracious Zargon as their god. In time, the Senadesians, this civilization of clever desert humans, thought to be of good alignment, decayed, and they were, over many generations, transformed to a pale-skinned, white-haired race of blood-worshipping evil, all in the name of Zargon. But our best evidence of this Batorian time before hell can be found in the third edition book, Elder Evils, which provides us with the following quoted information. Zargon ruled Beator as the father of the ancient Beatorians, a long extinct race that preceded the Batazu. With this, we can easily draw the inference and parallel that the Sendadesians were quite possibly what we now simply refer to as these ancient Beatorians. But what do we know of Zargon? The research of the literature tells us he was both a fiendish and eldritch monstrosity, roughly humanoid in shape, though significantly larger than humans, and in place of arms and legs, he had 12 horrifying tentacles. His head was that of a twisted monstrosity of spikes and horns with a large, prominent black horn in the center of his head. The Book of Elder Evil goes on to conclude our tale that when Asmodeus and his allies seized the Nine Hells, they purged the plain of these ancient Beatorians, removing Zargon's rule and enslaving the people, thus becoming among the first mortal souls to serve Asmodeus as devils. There are a myriad of conflicting reports on Zargon's actual level of power, from a near-invincible god to a demon prince of the abyss to a mere minor deity or even less. And further, some scholars have even speculated that Zargon was in fact the first and original ruler of Hell, an at least plausible conclusion based on our telling here, and something that the Lords of the Nine would certainly want suppressed or erased completely from history. Regardless, it is here that our story of an entire civilization of people end now all but lost to time, and the creation of the Nine Hells, depending upon your reading of these myths, was functionally a genocide of an entire civilization, meeting their dread end at the hands of the archdevil and infernal deity we know as Asmodeus, and potentially the gods of Mount Celestia. But that is a topic for another day. Gaining access to the lower planes is no simple matter. One does not just decide on a whim to take an impromptu day trip to Beator. In fact, any wise adventuring party might altogether reconsider any thought of entering such a hostile and evil place, choosing instead perhaps to slay a dragon or save a damsel in distress. But heroes got a hero, right? And if you must, then you'll find that even getting to the Nine Hells is a monumental task in and of itself. 
The best, and I use that word very loosely, means to access the first of the nine lairs involves a gateway portal located in a small city called Ribcage, located on the fringes of the Concordiant Domain of the Outlands, or simply known as the Outlands. Deserving of its own dedicated episode, the Outlands is a place of exception to the rules of the cosmos. Specifically, it is a place of true neutrality, a story for another time. But Ribcage will hold a special interest for anyone seeking entry to the Nine Hells, as the Cursed Gate is located there. And while the Cursed Gate does provide access to the first layer of Hell, Avernus, this portal is both located in a heavily fortified citadel and guarded intensely by the Batazu, who require an official invitation to allow passage. That's correct. In a domain of law and order of the evil kind, bureaucracy and paperwork are very important. And if you don't have the official letter, which I presume would be written on letterhead of a particular archduke, complete with a wax seal, then you're not getting through that portal. Lucky, or perhaps unlucky for you intrepid heroes, corruption reigns on this side of the gate, and finding a good forgery and or greasing the right palms with ample coin is an understood and accepted practice. After all, it's your very soul at risk, not theirs. And while the Cursed Gate is a official means to breach the lower plains and enter Avernus, it is not the only means. There is Sigil, also known as the City of Doors, a strange floating city that is only accessible by portals and magic. Sigil serves as a hub to interplanar travel and the arguable center of the multiverse. It's located in the center of the Outland. Travelers without an invitation to the Lower Plains should be aware that in this fascinating city, innumerable portals exist. In fact, any bounded opening, from a doorway or an arch to that of a picture frame, could in fact be a portal to another plane or simply to another part of the city. What may seem as completely random is rumored to in fact be a highly complex and well-guarded secret of patterns and mappings, meaning that for the right price, probably a lot, this knowledge could be harnessed, allowing you passage to Avernus. Any hero seeking such knowledge and access should, however, be very aware of the great danger that lies in not knowing who awaits on the other side of such a portal, especially for a mortal with no invitation or authority to be there. And now that you're in, have you considered how you're going to get out? As part of my continued efforts to save your life by discouraging your ambition to seek entry into the Nine Hells, I've just laid out for you the sheer difficulty and even the act of getting to Hell's first lair, Avernus. Assuming for the moment you were not slaughtered the moment you emerged, with your soul not immediately taken to the maggot pit where your fate now as a lemur awaits, now what do you do? The battle-scarred and perpetually blood-stained first layer of Avernus is one of the most deadly in all the multiverse, where fiendish devil patrols abound and incessant mortal-seeking fireballs rain from the fiery sky. Not to mention, you'll be lucky to not stumble upon a raging battle as fiendish and abyssal forces clash as part of the eternal blood war. But even with the little, okay, a lot of luck on your side, how do you traverse to the lower plains? While there is still much undiscovered in the Lower Plains, as many scholars and historians that have traveled there were never to return with any of the knowledge they gathered. One thing is certain, to reach any of the lower layered domains of evil, you must first pass through those that preceded it. No shortcuts for you, brave heroes. While portals do exist that can transport you down through each layer, there are two major obstacles preventing their use. The first lies in their location, as portals known to exist are well guarded and most usually housed within the fortresses and citadels across the various plains. And secondly, as previously mentioned, having no awareness of what is awaiting you on the other side and thus being unprepared in such a hostile area should be a sufficient deterrent. And that, generally speaking, leaves you to the mercy of the polluted, unholy, and diseased waters of the River Styx also known as the River of Blood, in case you were not already a little trepidatious. This evil, cross planar river interconnects all the lower plains from the hells of Beator to the Tartarian depths of Carceri and to the infinite abyss itself. In Avernus, the river swells within its banks as streams of blood from the unending battles of the Blood War increase both its depth and speed. Tributaries and branches beyond count 
trickle throughout most of the lower layers as well, but the main channel of the unholy river connects the first five plains all the way down to Stygia, where the Styx cuts a channel through the great frozen sea in the domain of the Archduke, Levistus. In Stygia, the river is the only open water in an otherwise frozen plain of terrifying cold and endless ice. The channel itself is often choked with massive icebergs, perhaps even the very icy prison that holds Levistus himself. And the open waters of the river are filled with fiendish sharks and kraken looking to feed on the isolated boats manning the river. It is here that the official historical record states the river ends. But well-known rumors speak of little-known offshoots that run deeper through the trenches of the lower layers, and perhaps all the way to the ninth layer, Nessus, home to Asmodeus, where rumor is the Styx dumps into the forgotten lake. But be wary, adventurer, the journey will be treacherous, and to be frank, some may not survive. Not only are the shores of these fetid waters often well patrolled, but those same waters are about as evil as anything else in this unholy domain. By merely touching the waters, you run the risk of losing all memory of your past forever. It is for all these dangers that anyone foolish enough to travel to the Nine Hells would be wise to locate and barter with the Marinoloths. These fiendish creatures are Yugoloth ferrymen who can expertly navigate the river Styx. And as is the nature of devils, they're happy to bargain and contract for the right price to transport mortals such as yourself along these fetid and supremely evil waters. But beware, the price will never be cheap, a king's ransom one might say, and the deeper you wish to go, the more extreme the price. <laughs> I'm guessing that saving that princess from an evil dragon is sounding mighty appealing right now, wouldn't you agree? Malbolge, the sixth layer of hell, was once ruled by an often whimsical but altogether hideous and evil trickster, the Night Hag Countess Malagard. Rumored to once be the consort, imagine that, of the former Lord of the Sixth, Moloch, she played a fascinating role in the Reckoning of Hell, another seminal event that is included in my forthcoming definitive lore series on the Nine Hells. Malagard's appointment as the ruler of Malbolge by Asmodeus himself was quite the anomaly in the historical hierarchy of the Hells, and she holds the title of being the only non-devil ruler under the reign of Asmodeus a fact that was not lost on or appreciated by the other Archdukes of the Plains. While her rule was not particularly special or noteworthy, her demise most certainly was. Suddenly and without warning, the hideous winged night hag began having horrific spasms and agonizing convulsions as she began to grow uncontrollably. As she fell to the ground, the very landscape around her began to quake and tremor. Soon after, the old crone's body began to rapidly expand like some horrific dark cancer. For a total of four agonizing days, the Countess' wails of torment and pain echoed throughout the entire plain for all to hear. The cracking of her bones like that of a deafening thunder and the tearing of her soft tissues and loss of vital bodily fluids like that of a raging river. Her parts, now detached from her wretched body, but still growing, began merging with and terraforming the terrain around her, even amid her continued screams of misery and anguish. Her hair became horrific forests of gigantic, lice-like creatures. Her fingers transformed into ivory towers that now dot the landscape. Her ribs exploding violently outward, forming a series of jagged mountains that now encircle Malbolge, and her internal organs ruptured into lakes of foul, repulsive waters. The Hag Countess quite literally became one with the very landscape around her. On the fourth and last day of the Hag's existence, the newly appointed ruler of Malbolge arrived. Most certainly by design, just as the last of the Hag's form, her skull malformed into a massive fortress, becoming the citadel from which her replacement, Glazia, would govern this layer of hell. Any questions of the hag's initial appointment, confusing to so many, were now made clear. Malagard was simply a diversion, a placeholder, if you will, until the daughter of Asmodeus was ready to rule. While the hag's screams have been stilled, her flesh can still be heard to this day. It now pulses through the land for all to hear as they traverse this terrifying plain. Treason, murder, seduction, Always a winning trifecta for a fun conspiracy, if you ask me. 
How does one murder the consort of the supreme lord of the hells and mother to an archduchess and not only remain alive, but in power? That is a most interesting question and a worthy subject of our number one spot of things you may not know about the Nine Hells. Indeed, many rumors and much speculation abound regarding the crimes and punishment, or lack thereof, levied against Levistus, the Lord of the Fifth and Archduke of Stygia, for his crimes of betrayal, treason, and the murder of Benzosia. Known to some as the Queen of Hell, Benzosia was consort to Asmodeus and mother to Glagia, the newest ruler of Malbolge. While it's true that these nefarious acts resulted in the imprisonment of Levistus deep within a frozen iceberg that floats the frozen sea of Stygia, yet Levistus remains the archduke of that plane, forcing us to ask, did the punishment fit the crime? As the official story goes, Asmodeus's consort Benzosia was traveling through Stygia inspecting the lair on Lord Asmodeus's behalf. There, Levistus ambushed her, although exactly how and why is still a matter in great dispute. Levistus supporters say he non-violently approached the fiendishly beautiful succubi, while others posit that the Archduke slayed her pit fiend bodyguards with the exception of one escapee, a loyal pit fiend, Duke of Hell and Constable in the court of Asmodeus by the name of Martinet. The tale then continues, and depending upon which version you believe, Levistus either offered to make her his queen in return for her knowledge and support in a coup d'etat to dethrone Asmodeus, or he simply tried to have his way with her. Either way, when Benzosia refused him, the official telling is that Levistus, both embarrassed and infuriated at this rejection, proceeded to commit the heinous act of murdering the Queen of Hell. So is that all there is to it? Well, it would not be on this list if it were. <laughs> Rumors have swirled since the crime and its all too lenient punishment that this was merely propaganda created to cover up a real insidious truth. Our first clue lies in Dungeon Magazine number 197 in an article called Codex of Betrayal. Here we learn in an alternate telling that Benzosia was believed to have actually held a strong hatred for Asmodeus, a complete 180 degrees from the official narrative. Instead, in this accounting of events, Benzosia and Levistus were actually co-conspirators and secret lovers each selfishly using the other as a means to undermine and usurp the dominion of Asmodeus. However, this already fragile arrangement was placed in further great peril when Glazia, daughter of Benzosia and Asmodeus, became infatuated with Levistus. The Archduke, always scheming, looked upon this as an opportunity to leverage the dangerous power of the love triangle, all in order to further turn the Lord of the Nine's house against him, and so, Levistus began a secret affair with Asmodeus' daughter as well. But as most love triangle stories end, not well, calamity strikes. One day, Glazia and Asmodeus, known to have father-daughter issues, had one of their routine disputes. Storming out in frustration, Glazia fled into Levistus' arms, only to find that her mother was already embraced within them. This, yet another act of betrayal in a comedy of betrayals and bad decisions fueled Glazia's already hateful feelings toward her mother, projecting in a raw and murderous rage. In a fit of red-hot jealous passion worthy of any modern-day drama, Glazia struck down her mother. This is where Martinet, the surviving pit fiend you may have already forgotten about, re-emerges into our tale. Forever loyal to the reign of Asmodeus, the pit fiend duke known as the Voice of Asmodeus has a particular set of skills, one of which is vast experience in the cleanup of political messes across Beator. In this capacity, Martinet adeptly proceeded to frame Levistus for the murder, allowing Asmodeus to save face and avoid questions of his command and that of Glazia as the new ruler of Malbolge. If this alternative story is to be believed, Asmodeus' choice to imprison but spare Levistus was another in a string of cold, calculated moves, perhaps done merely for the sake of precedent rather than from some personal feeling of anger or loss. Glazia's newfound hatred for Levistus lends even more credibility to these series of events. She is said to be obsessively focused on Levistus to this very day, although some say her anger towards him is but a mask for her more intimate true feelings. 
However, the facts as we know them show that the punishment of Levistus for such an act of treason and murder is far too lenient for a sovereign lord of hell, especially one who commands consequence for action. Regardless of the truth behind the actions of Levistus, even the official and perhaps propaganda-fueled story confirms he attempted to seduce and or played a direct or indirect part in the death of Benzosia, a direct challenge to Asmodeus' authority of rule. Yet, Levistus was merely imprisoned rather than destroyed and was in fact returned to power in the place of the far more loyal Geryon. And that leaves us with the following theory, positing that Levistus was actually just a convenient and unwitting pawn. Upon deposing Geryon, it was rumored that the infernal powers taken from him, power inherent in the very title of Archduke, were in fact not given to the imprisoned Levistus, leaving him far less powerful than the other lords of the Nine. Instead, perhaps the power was saved for the ascension of Glazia, and Levistus' treasonous behavior was simply tolerated because of the distraction that it served, a fact borne out in Glazia's later ascension as Archduchess of Malbolge. It is also rumored that Levistus himself has secretly come to accept this theory, although its implications paint him in a very unfavorable light. Admittedly, opening to such would only serve to confirm that he had not only been supremely outmaneuvered by the grand strategist that is Asmodeus, but that he must now, while maintaining an illusion of power, cow to Asmodeus and the other lords, his power being so utterly diminished. If these rumors are true, Perhaps Levistus shall be released and empowered at some point in the future, or perhaps he is but a placeholder for a new ruler of Stygia. We do not pretend to possess the grand intelligence of such a deity as no mortal should. So do with this info whatever you wish within your world. And with that, we shall pause our discussion of the Nine Hells, but just for now, we have just scratched the surface. There's so much more to come. The definitive lore on the Nine Hells at least a 13-part series, I'm already thinking that might actually be increased, will start this month. So I do hope that you will join me in that most interesting of discoveries. Please consider following on Twitter at Riches and Liches, checking out our Patreon and Discord, and if you feel like I earned it, maybe sub and ring that bell to help me grow this amazing community. Thanks for listening, and remember until next time, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.